Welcome, Spartans, to the latest Podcast Evolved book club. I am your host, Krista, and with me today is David. Hello, everybody. And Aaron. Hi, guys. And this time we are talking about Halo Glasslands. Not to be confused with Grasslands, as I see some people put in the scripts every once in a while. <clears throat> or. <laughs> Who wants to take us through the author release dates and synopses? I'll go mad and do this if you want. Okay, go ahead. The title is Halo Glasslands. This is the Kilo 5 trilogy, if you're not aware. Uh, The author is Karen Travis. You may remember her from such uh, great franchises as Gears of War and Star Wars. I recognize those. Yeah, the publisher is Tor Books. It's available on every format you can think of. It was released the 25th of October 2011. Oh my god. This is quite an oldie. This is, uh, I believe, if you're trying to picture when this was, this is the first novel to come out in the 343 era. Before Halo 4. This was supposed to be a lead up into Halo 4, kind of telling you the details of what happened between 3 and 4, correct? I think, yeah, there's a few of them because this and the Forerunner trilogy are both like leading up to Halo 4. Yeah, those were the six books you needed to read to understand Halo 4. (laughs) I think there were like four. I can't remember if two of the Halo 5 books came out. I know two of the Forerunner books came out before Halo 4. Yeah, I don't think either of them finished before Halo 4 came out. But uh, you notice as we go through here that they drop a few Easter eggy names of things that we wouldn't find out what they were until 4, so... Yeah, it's really foreshadowing Halo 4, but in a big way. Like, even just the little tidbits. This is where you can really see 343 weave their web in their multiple medias. It's kind of where where it all kind of starts. You may remember, what was that phrase they used to use? Transmedia. Transmedia, oh yeah. That was a thing for like five minutes and then someone told Kiki to never mention it again. (laughs) (laughs) Then they're just like, uh, people don't want to read books and we're just like, wait, no, we do. We do. We like books. But they're making too many, I can't keep up, it's terrible. I've almost caught up to every Halo book. I know we're we're leading, doing the Halo 5 trilogy, we're leading to finish off with Legacy of Onyx, because, spoilers, this kind of covers Onyx a little bit more. Uh, I So I need Legacy of Onyx and Broken Circle, and then I have read every single Halo book like a nutter. Well done. I'm really close. I think I actually do have them all. How dare you? Right. So I'll run through this synopsis, shall I? Oh, by the way, it's 464 pages. Also, my paperback version of this, because I lent it to my niece to read, because she's now worked her way through Ghosts of Onyx. It's very big. These were very big paperback novels. Yes. My copy of Mortal Dictata is about the size of a phone book. Yeah, it's a pretty big book. You are you are over exaggerating so much. I am not. It is like a phone book because phone books. Got I would a say the bit Halo smaller. encyclopedias like the phone book. No, phone books are smaller than that now, Krista. No one has landlines anymore. Oh uh, no! You no more yellow pages. All right. Um, I will read the synopsis and then I think we're going to dive into this. So. Uh, Set after the end of the Human Covenant War in 2553, Halo Glasslands explores explores the volatile political situation in the Halo universe following the end of the war. The novel picks up directly where Halo Ghost of Onyx left off, with Dr. Halsey, Chief Mendez, along with a group of Spartan 2s and 3s, stranded on a Forerunner shield world, locked in a subspace bubble, in the remnants of the artificial planet Onyx. Meanwhile, Office of Naval Intelligence Director Admiral Margaret Parangoski assembles a black ops team known as Kilo 5, which is assigned on a covert mission to sow discord between disparate Sangheili factions by any means necessary, as well as to arrest Dr. Halsey once she has been located. Throughout the story, the moral implications of the Spartan 2 program and those involved with it, particularly Dr. Catherine Halsey, are explored. In addition, social and religious impact the Sundering of the Covenant had on the Sangheili culture is explored in detail. Threads of the story also have connections to Halo 4. I think that might not be part of the synopsis. David might have copied that off Halopedia. Yes, I did. And if you didn't get it from the synopsis, this takes place in 2553. In fact, it kicks off, I believe, two months after the end of Halo 3? Or one month? I can't remember the specific start date. I think it might even be as soon as a month because they're still like digging bodies out of the rubble on Earth. Okay. Yeah, that sounds about right. How do we want to tackle this? 
I think we should tackle the Halsey story. So there are multiple stories going on in this book, and we're going to kind of try to talk about each one separately, even though they're kind of intertwined throughout the book. Every chapter kind of switches perspectives, as most books do nowadays. But let's focus on the Halsey kind of Parangoski rivalry going here. So yeah, this side story was something I wasn't expecting at all. And I say side story, it's almost a bulk of like, it's one of the main stories in the book. I really didn't think that it was going to be pretty much picking up where Ghost of Onyx left off. Like, it's pretty much like an almost direct sequel. Yeah, this this book is like two-thirds Ghost of Onyx sequel and one-third set up for Kilo 5. New things. Yeah, yeah, which is really interesting. Just to kind of, I know it summarized Ghost of Onyx in the synopsis real quick, but uh, Dr. Halsey came to Onyx where the Spartan 3 program was being held in order to save her Spartans because she knew there was a cache of Forerunner artifacts hidden in the planet. Little did she know that the planet was actually made of Forerunner artifacts, uh, mostly Sentinels, and inside Onyx was actually a huge Dyson Sphere shield world in which the Forerunners planned to hide during the firing of the Halo Rings. So at the end of that book, Halsey and a bunch of Spartans, I think it's the Spartan 2s are Fred, Kelly, Linda... Spartan 3s are Lucy, Mark, Olivia, Tom, and Ash. As well as Halsey and Chief Mendes end up trapped in this Dyson Sphere with no no direct means of escape. So they have a spherical object. It, Dyson Spheres are kind of like being on the inside of a sphere, is what I understand. Yeah. So the horizon kind of curves up. It's the inside of a sphere. Beer, and I believe it's the circumference of the orbit of the Earth. So it's millions of times the area of an Earth. Yeah, it's it's a pretty pretty crazy. So we we kind of start with those characters being in that situation pretty right pretty much right off the bat, and of course they go around trying to discover and figure out wh- what's going on. Um, but in conjunction to this story, we have Admiral Margaret Parangoski, which was mentioned in Ghosts of Onyx, but only pretty much in passing. It's one scene she's kind of in, and she doesn't do much. She just kind of stares at people. Yeah. Parangoski is the head of Oni. Uh, She is the woman in charge, kind of doing everything, all the shady stuff that goes on. She was the one who approved the Spartan Project and worked pretty closely with Halsey when that was going on, though she didn't know everything that went on in the Spartan program. And she is training her protege, Captain Saren Osman, who is actually a dropout of the Spartan program. And she's an interesting character. What do you guys think of Saren? I love her. I love the reuse um, of these kind of the washouts because I don't think we had too much information on them beforehand. I think we had one story in Halo Evolutions. Did we? Yeah. Pariah is the only story, I think, up until this stage. And he was he was one of the Spartans that had the crazy, like, basically just crazy uh, stuff happen to his body after the augmentations and just couldn't do anything anymore. Oh, yeah. Okay. Osman did have some disfigurement, but was, uh, but Parangoski found her and actually corrected the disfigurement. So Osman doesn't have the enhanced abilities of a Spartan. She doesn't have the physical abilities, but she still has some of the... Um, Genetic stuff. Genetic, yeah. But she's cool. I think, yeah, I just love the setup of, there's so many new characters in this book, and I love how they interact with the current lore and the new stuff. They're so well done. I like the idea that we get this from the point of view of, this is a Spartan 2 that doesn't hold Halsey in high regard. She's, like, she's kind of tainted by Parangoski, but she also has her own reasons not to like Halsey, because Halsey kind of dumped her out like the the trash. Mm Mm-hmm. When she washed out of the program, so it's cool that you have this. You, you saw it in Fall of Reach in the game that the Spartan Threes did not give a shit who Catherine Halsey was, and then here you have this Spartan Two that like kind of doesn't care about Halsey shit. She she actively despises Halsey. Yeah, this is which is an overarching theme of this book and the kind of trilogy, and I think a lot of people are kind of negative on it a little because of that. And I think we'll, we'll probably talk to that as, as we go through. Yeah. Parangoski and Osman actively hate Halsey. Saren, uh, Kilo 5 is assembled and Kilo 5 isn't meant to 
actually find Halsey or anything like that. You know, Perengoski's obviously looking for her, but Saren and Kilo 5 were only put together to basically um, work on the Sanghili, and we'll get into that a little later. But this book goes into some crazy details on the negative ramifications of the Spartan 2 program, because up until now, we've been kind of... We're basically Spartan 2s, the way, like, us as readers and as fans of the series. I mean, we love Halsey. She kind of created our favorite Spartans. She created our favorite characters. She's great. And so now we kind of are thrust into this very... It's almost shocking reading this book for the first time and seeing just how much negativity is around the Spartan program in Halsey. Which I think is an interesting take to do it, especially when you have like this franchise is so well loved and everyone loves Spartan 2s and that's the whole thing and Spartan 2s are great. And then you have you have the ramifications of what they did to create them coming out, which I think is cool and I like that it's addressed. I mean, this book is very negative on Halsey, which is a character I love, so I kind of found it a little bit kind of difficult to read in that way in terms of it's very focused on that one person. And I think, it, you know, the program as a whole had, like, a lot of other people involved. And I know only are distancing themselves from that, and that was the whole point. Some of it, it's, it needed to happen in terms yeah. of the universe, do you know what I mean? And I liked, I appreciate that they did it. So just some of the, uh, just to kind of go over the Spartan program really quick, because we're going to be talking about this a lot, you know. What Halsey did is, of course, she needed, what, Halsey is a perfectionist, like, almost crazily so a perfectionist. She only wanted candidates that had the perfect genetic makeup to become her Spartans. So she and a bunch of Oni actually searched the galaxy and the outer colonies for children ages five to six to see if they had the correct genetic makeup. If they found, they made a list of candidates and then Oni was able to kidnap these children and replace them with Flash cloned children. And the Flash clones are interesting because Osmond didn't know about the Flash cloning at all. I don't think any of the Spartans did. No one seemed to know, and Parangoski is really pissed off about it. This is... It's the clones. Like, as we go through this book, you find out the real kicker because there's, like, multiple times where Parangoski says she's just as shitty as Halsey because she approved everything Halsey did. And people like Halsey can only do the things they did because people like her let them. But the real kicker is these Flash clone children. Halsey covers it in the journal a little bit because they also bring up Halsey's journal a lot, which you may remember from the special edition of the... I love that that's an in-canon thing. Well, we see it in some of the cutscenes of Halo 5 as well. Yeah, like we get this. It's a thing. It existed. It survived the glassing of Reach, so uh, only have it. And Parangoski and has read it and then given it to Osmond to read, which has kind of only fueled Osmond's fury because I, I think Parangoski says at one stage later, like, your journal's full of sanctimonious, you know, sh- bullshit that you've twisted the truth a little bit to suit your needs. It's kind of like the start of Halo 4 where Halsey says her Spartan saved humanity and the guy that's interrogating her is like, you're, you're twisting the facts. You didn't invent Spartans for this. But it's the clones that really piss off Parangoski because she didn't know it was a thing. She didn't have to, Halsey didn't have to do the clones. She didn't have to make them, but she did it anyway. And these clones of children just die. Yes, they all die horribly. And it, the, the book delves into clones a little more and I'm kind of, I don't want to spoil anything for the further book, so I don't want to go into too much detail of clones in general, but just know they are a thing, they exist, and they're pretty horrible. And actually, was it Halo Legends that had the Spartan escaping Reach and then going home to find the clone waiting for her? Yeah, I think it was Daisy. That's that's actually a really interesting uh, story. So it's if you really haven't sad. watched yeah. that, it's really sad. So if you haven't watched that, I'm not sure how canon it is, but it's actually a really interesting uh story there. So this is a lot of Parangoski talking about how much she hates Halsey, Osmond telling her crew Vaz and Mal, and Phillips how much she hates Halsey and what she's done. And then Halsey telling herself how much she hates herself, but then kind of also talks about how good she is. And then Mendez telling Halsey how much she hates her. And also caught in the middle of this is poor Naomi, 
Uh, Naomi is one of the, one of the Spartan twos that did not get kicked out of the program, and she ends up on the Kilo Five crew. And so all of the other members of the crew, uh, the ODSTs, Vaz, Mal, and in some regards, the scientist Phillips, but not quite. They feel very attached to her when they learn about where she comes from, while Naomi's just like, I love who I am. This is great. I'm a Spartan. Not quite like that, but... She's a Spartan too, yeah. She's properly inducted and knows what she is. But she's a great story arc throughout the trilogy. Yeah, yeah, and we'll we'll go back to her in a little bit, but it's... I don't know, what do you guys think about the I hate Halsey party? I think it makes sense. I know people get a bit upset at how strong it is, but I think... Okay, we kind of get it a little bit. I think the only person that's a little unexpected is Mendez, because he doesn't seem this angry in Ghosts of Onyx, but then again, we don't really get much from Mendez's point of view in Ghosts of Onyx it's mostly Kurt. Yeah. Mendez could secretly be simmering away in this for a long time, but in this book you get it all. Like he has come this is what, twenty years after the Spartan Two program, so he has like reevaluated life and realized, you know, better late than never that fuck it he wouldn't have done it again. Yeah. And he's like consoled himself with the fact he they did the Spartan Three program a little differently. That was kind of his his own personal redemption. It's enough for him to believe that five year old orphans can volunteer instead of kidnapping them. Like I can I kinda get it because we don't really up until now we never addressed it in the Eric Nyland books, they completely as great as they are, they completely gloss over the fact that Halsey has committed this absolutely horrific and atrocious crime where she's just kidnapped all these children and experimented on them. It's almost like a he almost paints it in a heroic light. It's just like such a quick chapter of her and then the kids were kidnapped and replaced with clones and now we go into the Spartan program and then these like five year olds I remember a scene where like in the, you're as John, he's kind of recalling his first day at boot camp and these kids, he's running them through drills that a normal Marine would have, an adult Marine, and these kids are, like, throwing up because they can't take the physical exertion. It's not touched about as much. It's more of just the story of John becoming the great hero. Yeah, I th- I don't know. I like this. Like, I like the idea that they address it. Um, it's come up a couple of times since where they go into, even in this trilogy, in the later trilogy, they go in, or the later book, they go into more depth on the clones and they touched on it and Hunt the Truth and a couple of other times. Like Halsey's a good character and I like her, but she's I like even in this book she admits a few times she's a terrible person. But she's kind of accepted it and she's okay with it. But I yeah. like that and the thing is, I think you get all of this you mostly get the shock and the disgust from the people on the outside because the Spartan twos just accept their lot in life, that it is what it is, and they wouldn't be Spartans without it. And the Spartan 3s also are something similar. They, like, they don't really have thoughts one way or the other. But it's the ODSTs and it's Phillips. They're the, like, they're the, what the reader should be thinking the whole time, I think. Because as they yeah. get told about all this, like we get to one stage later in the novel where Vaz at one stage contemplates executing Halsey. Yeah, it is a really big scene. It's a great scene. He's so mad, and it's it's an it's almost it's so great because this ODST who's followed the rules all this time just decides this woman is pure evil, and even if I get locked up forever, it'd be worth it to kill her. Yeah, he accepts the fact that like a woman like Halsey will never be done away with, and she's going to be used for more work and more stuff, and that like BB talks him out of it. Can we talk for a minute about the people in Kilo 5? I, I need a little minute to chat about characters. Or do we want to finish the Halsey story real quick and then we'll go into the Kilo 5? Do, do. So where does Halsey end up at the end of the story? I know she gets captured by Oni again. And that was the... She, she get, they get out of the shield world or they return the... Uh, Onyx comes back into real space, which is a cool idea. And then they just kind of arrest Halsey. The kind of devious thing about this is... One... Well, one... Margaret made it so that Naomi, her own Spartan 2, is the one who gets to take her in and handcuff her, which is a very interesting scene, these dynamics with the Spartans and watching Halsey get get a um, arrested for the crimes of, you know, just horrible scientific experiments and stuff like that. So that's quite a powerful scene. 
And then Margaret, being just the fucking most diabolical person, has already marked Halsey as killed in action on Reach. She even has a plaque on the memorial at the end of Halo 3. So basically, Halsey just becomes her... I don't want to say pet, because that's kind of weird, but almost like her prisoner, just to do with as she will. So I think Halsey at this point ends up going to the experimental ship. No, I think Halsey ends up on... It could be both. Doesn't she end up there and on the facility from Halo 4? Didn't she have a lab there? Yeah, I think so. Or I the think, cartographer? I think this is where Osman is introduced to the Infinity and they start talking about it as a huge project and Osman basically just ships her out that way. Yeah, she's basically... Halsey's life now is to install Forerunner tech. She's just become like a Forerunner mechanic. She's off the books. She doesn't exist. This is her life now. She's just an Oni perf- prisoner and is told to just make things better. Work slave. Yeah. And they've, they, of course, found a huge cache of technology and Onyx, along with original engine, in, original Forerunner engineers, which is a, quite a big thing into the universe. But we can get back to that later. So let's talk about the Kilo 5 crew, what their mission is, and let's introduce ourselves to the crew. Who wants to go over those guys? Uh, I can give a quick rundown, and you can fill in the gaps in case I, I kind of forget. First off, I love the idea of what Kilo 5 is. It is a secret group, uh, a secret team created to keep the Sangheili fighting each other to propel that civil war so that their attention is off Earth and humanity. I love that idea. So they go in and kind of do whatever it needs to do, assassinate people, uh, give them weapons, all that kind of stuff that they kind of, all these kind of shady, only back dealings. I love this. This is kind of the first kind of book I think we get to really see this side of Oni, this specific one. And um, so I love the idea of giving this team an uber amazing prowler, um, all this kind of equipment and just kind of like set them loose, which is kind of, um, it was just such, such a cool idea. I love it. So then you get like the very complex feelings and emotions of, What's it like being a Spartan 2 and like not killing Sangheili, but instead working with them? And it's kind of weird and it's really kind of cool. And then you have like the ODSTs, how they feel about it. You have this scientist. So, sorry, I'll, I'll go through the individuals. So, Kilo 5 is first off, um, Saren Osman. And uh, she's a captain, like we've been talking about already. She's a washout from the Spartan 2 program and she's awesome. She is being groomed pretty much from the start to take over Oni from Paragosphy, from Margaret. So, there's kind of a, a very special relationship between these two characters. Yeah, it's like mother daughter, really. Yeah, very much so. Was Osman? Yeah, Osman wasn't flash cloned. She was taken from the streets, um, and so they didn't like leave a clone behind. She was pretty much uh, a loner at that stage. I think they said her mother was like a prostitute, and her father was someone else. I can't really remember this, but um, she reads her own file in the theory and in, in through this. Um, but I think it's this book she has. A, she obviously has access to everything. Uh, as being a, like a pretty high level only officer so um she eventually reads her own file and um, where she learns kind of her past and her history and stuff which is kind of in to, like her last name is just a name made up by Perengasi to hide the fact that um she was a spartan too wash out so they just kind of gave gave her uh the, the last name i think her actual real last name is czech or shenik or something like that it, i think they made it was it's some like hungarian or romanian name i think uh, anyway anyway um you have Professor Evan Phillips. He is a pretty much the science guy of the team. And uh, he is fascinating. He's a pretty cool dude. Um, he pretty much... Uh, did he just get kidnapped into the team? I can't really remember. No, he... Uh, when we start the book off, it's uh, Osman and Phillips are doing a mission. Phillips is the Sanghili expert. This is his... Ah, uh, yes. He, he He's not so much science science as like cultural science, but like he is obsessed with all things Sanghili. As a, as a species. So the first time we meet him, him and Osman are doing a mission where he's making the introductions between Osman and an elite called Avumed Telkam, who is this leader of like a fac- rogue faction of elites that do not agree with the Arbiter. So Evans is supposed to be like a one-time operative. He's here for this mission and then he goes on again. And I think like his price to do this mission was like first-hand experience meeting an elite on a neutral planet because i think it says at one stage uh, osman says something like she thinks to herself like he's probably got about 15 books 
in his head about this right now. Oh yeah, he's looking, yeah, he's trying to make his own career, make himself famous writing books about. Yeah, and then slightly after that, some, they tweak it and Phillips gets brought into Kilo 5 as a permanent member. Which he is actually a pretty cool member uh, as a non-combatant, but he's pretty kind of, he's essential to the team, especially given what their mission is. Um, going behind St. Healy lines and stuff so he's really good um, you have two uh, ODSTs well there's three in total but I'm going to talk with two of them you've got Corporal Vaz Belloy and Staff Sergeant Malcolm Mal Griffin so these guys are just ODST badasses essentially they were on a team together before this so they pretty much get brought in as more or less muscle um, for lack of a better term they don't have, I don't think they have any specific specialities um, but they're pretty cool guys um, Vaz is pretty much the hot blooded kind of ODST that you would expect. Um, Mal is pretty more well adjusted. Um, you have then the character I forgot, which is Leon Davenue, who is a pilot. She's an ODST brought in to pilot the team. Like I mentioned, they have a prowler called the Port Stanley Port. Port, St- yeah, it's Port Stanley, yeah. Port Stanley, UNSC Port Stanley is a prowler. It is amazing. They have a, a pelican, which is probably the one of the most badass pelicans. Uh, in, in the story uh, in any kind of Halo world which doesn't crash but it does take some damage it's t- called Tart Cart isn't it? Tart Cart that's it is. right although I need to check again because I'm pretty sure when I went through this book did Tart Cart change halfway through this novel because I think when it starts I... Tart Cart is a different ship uh, yeah see it isn't it's a pelican but the engineers get their hands on it and like upgrade it to like crazy amounts they they give it stealth and all that kind of it's stuff it's like the start of it they talk about how when they're going down to the planet to bring weapons to Avumed Telcam the warthog is inside this dropship so it can't be a pelican I don't think it was the tart cart yet I think they get the tart cart later then after Leon you pretty much have the other brand new character to this team which is an AI called Black Box or BB so BB has been introduced as part of the team and BB is awesome. He's an awesome, awesome, awesome AI and he is pretty much all of Oni. He's just the, this uber AI with access to everything. He was created from the brain of Perangovsky's kind of best friend, more or less, slash maybe lover. I don't know, there's like the links between there are like a little bit ambiguous, but one of our best friends pretty much died and... I can't remember. There is a story behind him. Like, there's a. I think that's in the last novel. It's a, yeah, it's it's in the last novel because that's when Osman finds out who she is and BB finds out who he is. Yeah, I remember there being there being a big thing about who BB, where BB came yeah, from. Yeah, so he's a uh, he's basically he's Osman's personal AI. Uh, even though Parangoski like commissions him and he has a soft spot for Parangoski, but very quickly. He, she like hands over the reins to BB or of BB to Osman and it's just like he's yours now take care of him yeah it's pretty cool so then you have this uber team giving this amazing ship all this kind of resources and kind of send out into the world to go and um, that's Kilo 5 so that's kind of the main half of the story so Aaron you can add in anything else that I missed out there I don't think there's too much to mention like I think my favourite people in Kilo 5 is Phillips and BB BB's wonderfully sarcastic and witty and if 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 you haven't read this, I'm surprised you're listening to the book club. But BB doesn't have a humanoid avatar, unlike almost I think every other AI we've ever come across. BB is just a black box, which funnily a few people mentioned throughout this that because of the way holograms project in the Halo universe, he's actually a blue box. Yep. <laughs> so he's just this black box. He he believes he doesn't want to be a person the way. He thinks Cortana and the others do. He believes he is just pure intellect. He is nothing more, nothing less. So there's no point like going through the charade of having a tiny blue person. But he does do creative things with his blue box because I think at one stage he he brings Osman good news and he does it with a little bow around his box. And I think that's when they find out where Halsey is, isn't it? Yeah, I think they do that. And then he rotates his cube, so he always rotates one face of the cube to face the person he's talking to. So they very quickly like establish that even though he's just a box and he has no features, you kind of get the feeling that you know when he's looking at you. Even though he is Port Stanley and they all live inside him. I like that bit at the start where they're... They're like getting used to life with BB. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of conversations and stuff about them just getting used to him being around. But I like towards the end of the book, they kind of just accept him as part of the crew. Yeah, even though he's there all the time. 
I suppose one person we didn't mention that is like a, a very important member of Kilo 5 is prone to drift. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, totally forgot prone to drift. He he gets a friend in the next novel, but for this novel he is uh, he is the first, well no, he's the second only engineer we know of that only have got because the first would be Virgil. Yeah. Virgil and then they get prone to drift. They rescue him from a transport ship that a few brutes were on where they were actually taking him to Avumed Telcam. It's all very messy. That's also a really interesting sequence because that's the first time BB is interfaced with another soldier. He's interfaced with Naomi and it's him being able to experience things like adrenaline and just the heat of battle. So it's really it it's it's really really cool. And I love- this is the first time they dive into like what AIs can do for Spartans because up yeah. until now it always in the earlier books the Cortana chief relationship is very sort of one way like it it in those books you get the impression that Cortana has no effect whatsoever over chief physically whereas when you look at this BB talks about how he can actually like increase response times for Naomi and like make her faster than even her Spartan augmentations allow her to be. I'm pretty sure the Halo Fall of Reach had stuff like that in about Cortana actually adjusting John. That's right. I suppose they do mention it. I just always think of it as he always describes Cortana as the cold feeling in the back of his head. They only really said it once and they've never really delved into it that much about what Cortana actually does to John because there's nothing in gameplay where when you have Cortana and when you don't, you don't, nothing ever affects you in the game. But in the books, they've definitely mentioned that like his response time is faster and she does do certain things for him. It's just, it's mostly reactionary stuff, correct? It's just enhancing his already natural abilities. He can't drive Naomi like a puppet, but he can, he can help her along. Although like when he talks about this whole boarding scene with a craft he basically realizes Naomi really doesn't need any help yeah yeah he just kind of is there for the ride yeah but you get this like two points of view because you have BB's point of view through Naomi's suit armor and all the equipment and then you have his point of view through Naomi so he, like he sees the disparity between things happening in real time and how she experiences everything which is cool yeah it's pretty cool I think that's about it there's not much like I think Phillips and BB are very similar. Mal and Vaz are fairly cool. I think Mal's the more likable of the two. And I, I like Devereaux, but she doesn't get much to do in this book. She just like taxi drives a couple of times. Uh, do we want to go into uh, Jewel Mandama and Telcam and their connection with uh, Kilo 5? Yeah, so this is kind of where these characters partake. And you can see before, any, like we said, this came out before Halo 4. So Halo 4 has a whole mode called Spartan Ops all about chasing Juma and Dana and this character is really I knew I don't think I'd read this book before Halo 4 definitely I don't think I did at all I'm pretty sure the trilogy was out actually by the time I picked up all three of them who that character was all through through Halo 4 and stuff like that is not really explored because it's all done here um so it is very much like we said three for three almost expected you to have read this before playing Halo 4 he's he's a cool character so I'll let you guys talk about him now. I've said my bit. Telcam is the commander of... Servants of the Abiding Truth. Okay, so the Servants of the Abiding Truth are almost like the OG Sangheili religion, which the oh, the original Sangheili religion before the Covenant kind of told them about the Great Journey and everything is Forerunner relics are to be revered and loved and not studied or used. And that was the whole fight between the elites and the, and the Sanshai Hum, or the Prophets, was that the Prophets used the artifacts to enhance their own technology, where the Sangheili saw it as desecrating sacred monuments. So the Servants of the Abiding Truth are actually this very, very radical group of um, religious Sangheili that are like, if you touch our artifacts, we will murder you. Yeah, let's say they're like this. They're like these hardcore monks, but the problem is because they all served in the Covenant, they're now hardcore military monks. Yeah. Because they comment on this. I think Jewel at one stage goes to their temple and he's greeted by uh he's greeted by Telcam, but Telcam is a uh, what is his rank? Oh, he's a uh, He's a very high higher up monk, isn't he? Yeah, he's he? like no, he's like a Oh, he's not like he's not a fleet master. He's a like a ground elite. 
Oh, a major? Like a, like a major or something? Yeah. Let me look it up. Tell, he's something tell like that, if, if David can look it up there. But he's in his armor, and he greets Jewel with, you know, a rifle on his back, and Jewel's like, this isn't quite what He was I a expected. field master. Field master, that's what I was trying to think of. So these are now monks with the training to, like, take on the Arbiter, which is the whole point. And then you've got Jewel, who is a disenfranchised Kaidon, who, while he has no real ill intent towards the Arbiter, he doesn't trust the Arbiter because the Arbiter's made friendly with humans, which is his whole thing. Telcam, Telcam and Jewel come together because Jewel is on the hunt for like-minded people. But I love the way that it's always seen that like Jewel is lying his way into this cult because he sees this cult as like a potential resource to be used and abused and I think that's very interesting. Jewel isn't religious, he just hates humanity. Yeah, which I think is cool. He thinks humanity can't be trusted but he's kind of, he's like an atheist elite. He he knows, like he still struggles with it occasionally but he knows himself that the Forerunners weren't gods, they were aliens. Their technology is technology, they're not holy relics. But he's always on guard around the monks because he's always afraid that he will uh, reveal himself to be like a heathen and then they will take him out. Cast him out. But it's kind of the story of Jewel is using people and situations around him to his advantage because this all like leads into him forming the like new covenant in Halo 4. This is this is the start of where he comes from with this. Just one I'm just going to backtrack a little because this book is actually one of the first times we actually get inter- introduced to Sanghelios and just Sanghili culture in general. Oh yeah, the 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 places you go in this book are awesome. So, like, I love Venezia. I think I've said that numerous times in different places, different shows. Is this the first time we went to Venezia? This is the first time we've been to Venezia. I freaking love this place. I want more stories set here. So, I love that this trilogy is great for coming back to Venezia and really setting up as a place where, like, a seedy underbelly but has humans and various covenant races living together in one city in a kind of loose alliance of, like, they're all criminals essentially getting together and, like, this is just having a city um, maybe criminals is harsh, but you know they are criminal. As this is where they come to do stuff. Oh, it's so good! I love Venezia. So Venezia is a mix planet who never got attacked by the Covenant that has Covenant races and humanity, and it's just kind of a lawless place where there's not really a currency. It's mostly trade, scavenging. It's ca- the weird thing is when they go into it, it's actually not a lawless place because they. I think they talk about it when they drop off. Uh, well, it's not UNSC. It's not or government. The United Do you know what I mean? Earth. There isn't a government. There is like a, a but coalition. They, I, I think the funny thing they comment on at the start is they have like uh, driving passes and they have toll roads and they have credit chips and they have this like whole little black market economy. And I think they talk about it like they talk about the city having like small skyscrapers and stuff. Whereas I yeah, it's a it's a normal looking city. Yeah, in my head, I always picture it as like small shacks and like Wild West sort of setup. Whereas this sounds more like no, this is small city setup on this planet, where weirdly humans and aliens are kind of living in a weird sort of harmony yeah it's cool i want to see more of it i want to actually see it i think it'd be great to go there in a game or something like that. that'd be amazing the artwork for it is so cool or a tv Just show jumbled together <gasps> i wonder if we're gonna get one of those no there'll never be a halo tv show <laughs> so back to saying helios we learned a couple key things about saying heli culture one saying heli culture is divided into different clans so every clan has their own keep every keep has their leader which is called the kaidon that kind of oversees everything arbiter of course has one of the biggest keeps ever um and they all kind of it's almost a power struggle between keeps to see which one is going to end up being the overall power on the planet they divide them into like is it provinces where you get like the keeps report to like the provincial keep and then that person's over it because i think it's almost like the way the mi- medieval way it was kind of run it's kind of like where ca- there's a castle and a keep and a lord and it's peasants. It's like Game of Thrones. <laughs> yeah. Because like Jewel, Jewel and his friend whose name I can't remember right now go to like the lord's keep to uh, to have like a talk with the Arbiter. He like calls all the Kaidons together so they can have like a question and answer session with him. Oh the Arbiter's so badass in this book. 
Oh, the Arbiter's so good. We'll get into him real quick. But yeah, that's that's just kind of an overall arcing thing of Sangheili culture, so. Hang on, I'm sorry, I just hate to put in here, but is this where, did, were we introduced before now to the setup of Sangheili not knowing who their fathers are and the women basically no, being this like is the new. secret power? This is the first time, isn't it? Because it, like it's a good setup that, you know, a, an elite has to make his own way in the world and can't ride on... Like the success and name of his father, but like Jewel, Jewel knows whose kids are his, which is interesting. Yeah, he shouldn't know, but he does. But he tries not to show them any favoritism. But when, like, when, uh, when he hears the kids training in the yard and someone being uh, punished in some way, he like looks out and he's like, "Oh, good, it's not my kids," and then kind of like continues on it's really funny it also introduces the lady saying Haley as well because as i said jules wife is this like strong cool character yeah she comes into her own later in the series she's a cool character later on in the series all right yeah and she has her head like screwed on completely because while jule and i think she describes it as there's all these like elite warriors roaming St. Helios with nothing to do and they're just like killing time and wandering about whereas she's the one that's rolled her sleeves up and she's seen the problems that St. Helios is about to have because up until now they've relied on the covenant for everything and she's like where are we going to get our food from where are we going to fix our ships what are we going to do for our technology it's like the shit has hit the fan the engineers are gone we need to figure this stuff out for ourselves and I think when Jewel leaves, when he leaves his, like, hometown, she's already, like, building barns and shit to get, like, farming going up again. And she she's, like, really rational. If we could have got all the women together, we might have avoided all of this in the first place, I think is what I've learned. Yeah. The female elites are much easier to deal with. Honestly, if the, the Sangheili males are pretty much only made for just fighting and stuff and so the females kind of just handle basic logistics of day-to-day life of course they didn't have to handle much with the covenant because they would provide food and stuff like that but they kind of overall like keep the keeps together when all of the males are off killing people i feel like it's the drawback to the honor system they kind of have where all the males are away trying to make a name for themselves whereas the women because they don't have to make a name for themselves they like have more realistic worries and concerns. They're not out there trying to do the most badass stuff. They're running the actual place. Yeah. And then you get to see a lot through, like, Phyllis when he goes to San Helios. That's great scene of him. And I like the way of, like, interacting between humans and San Heli, where, like, he does things, he solves their little puzzle box, which is supposed to be really hard, and he's just so good at it, and they're just all stunned that an alien or, like, a lesser race, i.e. humanity, could figure this out. I think that's great way and cha- great way of showing the mentality changing. Yeah, that it's not just Arbiter is not just the only one who actually gives a shit about humanity. Um, it's actually the the people of St. Helios get that element that that exposure. I thought, I thought that was cool. Uh, do we want to quickly go over Arbiter and what he's up to? Being a badass. All right, being a badass. Okay, let's continue. <laughs> we get Lord Hood introduced again in this because he comes to St. Helios to chat with the Arbiter. Because uh, this is what, like a month, month and a half after the end of Halo 3. So this is the weird thing where the timeline gets a little fuzzy for me. Because Lord Hood is organizing a memorial service in Voy for the people that failed. Which is the one the at the end of Halo, of Halo 3. 3. Where he's come to St. Helios to invite the Arbiter to Earth for the memorial service. Which is fine. But... Later on, at the end of Halo 3, the Arbiter and the Shipmaster sound like they haven't been home yet, even though this book sets it up that the Arbiter's been on his grand tour of the Keeps, like, trying to bring everyone together. So there's a little bit of a, a, like, weirdness going on there, but I love when Osman and Hood are together when they're going to visit the Arbiter, because they talk about how she's like, oh, I'm going to have to work with him soon. He's going to be like my he, she'll be like his counterpart and she's like you're a nice guy and I don't want to fuck you over but I have to fuck you over a bit because he's come to like make peace with the Arbiter while she's secretly selling weapons in the background to the other elites. It's definitely a strange dynamic those two. I also find it funny how much the Arbiter because when, the, when they go to speak to the Arbiter and get to go to St. Helios for pretty much the first time Phillips of course accompanies them in order to kind of butter them up. 
They're like, you love Sanghili and you can speak their language, so you're just going to come to help us butter up the Arbiter. <laughs> I think Osman says at one stage, is like, it's probably the fact that this will be the first human that the Arbiter's ever been in close contact with who he won't even smell fear of because Phillips is just like in awe of everything that's going on the entire time. And it's genuine awe because yeah. even though he's like doing the dirty with Oni, he's still thrilled to be here the whole time. Which I think like it rubs off well in the Arbiter because he he invites Phillips to come back and have a visit. Yeah, and that kind of sets up the end of the book and the and leading into the next book is Phillips's adventures on Sing Helios. Yes, because he ends up going and searching out his only uh, elite contact that he really has on the planet, which is Telcam. He ends up at I suppose we'll be we talk about this, but anyway, he ends up at Telcam's like sanctuary in the city and he's talking to Telcam and then suddenly the shit hits the fan and I think the last thing you hear is Telcam going like oh this isn't us this is something different and there's like an explosion and then everyone loses contact with uh, Phillips yeah and Telcam also is trying to warn Phillips to leave because he's about to be a because Telcam knows he's about to start marching the servants of abiding truth to the arbiter's keep and start the civil war and they're like, you need to get out of here before this starts. stuff starts hitting the fan. And of course, that's when it starts hitting the fan. Also, a quick, quick note, because Phillips isn't actually equipped to deal with, you know, interrogations and stuff like that, they actually give him a fragment of BB and a lethal injection. Yes, they give him a like a pin for his jacket. By the way, is this the first time, because we've mentioned fragments, I think this is the first time we really get into huge details about the potential of like AI fragments because I think we get a little bit of it in First Strike with Cortana. Yeah, I think it's been talked about in Reach and stuff because Cortana, in I think in Halo Reach, Cortana's fragments are trying to look through Ackerson's Spartan program, the Spartan 3 program, and she's like sabotaging him. Yeah, I feel like they dive into them more here though because you like, you have all these intertwined things you get like a lot of insight into the workings of ai and how they operate in the halo universe because they're like all spread out and i think at one stage bb tries to explain it to the crew about how it's imagined a human multitasking but far more complex and everything's happening all at the same time and they go into more about this in the next book and they also deal with like what happens when fragments go wrong. Yeah, and what happens when fragments can't actually... Because uh, fragments are always kind of reconnecting with the main AI. Every so every couple of cycles, they reconnect with the AI and bring uh, knowledge back and forth. And then... What I really loved is how BB's character develops through the splitting of his fragment and not being able to connect to it. And then because the fragment learns so much on its own... Without connecting, he gets he's got a big kind of dilemma of reintroducing this damaged fragment into himself and not knowing what the consequences of it will be. Will he change and what will he learn? Yeah, that's the next. And then he struggles with that. That it's the next book, but it's a cool piece of character development that I love. That's kind of set up here at the end. Yeah, they kind of he explains it. I think is if you have a fragment, you know, if he makes a fragment and sends it off, he can cut that fragment off and get rid of it. But this is the difference in like consciously making the decision to cut your arm off and having someone tear it out of your socket which is kind yeah. of what bb has to deal with in this which is cool because uh, like we have cortana but cortana is a very humany persony ai whereas i feel like bb gets more into the nitty-gritty of life as an ai yeah yeah i feel that too B bb is a great character and uh he becomes even more interesting as the series progresses so i'm really excited for us to talk about him more yeah he is without a doubt i think my favorite ai in halo even above cortana yeah i, th I yeah. think bb would be my favorite and by the way he also features in season two of hunt the truth he's in a few different places he's also in um the book about iona's trial what was that called that short story saint's testimony saint's testimony there we go which is a very head scratcher of a book you need to sit down and read that a few times and be fully alert at all times i think we have a book club on that that we recorded a while back we do yes sure do go check it out it's awesome what have we got left in this i think we've kind of covered most of the main 
plot points, didn't we? Is there anything? I don't think we've captured did the capture of Jewel Mandama, so we should go over that real quick. Jewel is getting really uh, buddy buddy with Telcam. They're like, hey, hey, just kind of broing around. And then Telcam's like, yo, I gotta go pick some stuff up at the store. Uh, you want anything? And Jewel's like, can I come? And he's like, nah, man. Yeah, he's just like, my friend at the store won't like you. He's like, they're very jumpy. Yeah, but, and <laughs> Jewel's like, man, are you getting weed or something? And he's like, uh, maybe. Yeah, and like, I love that Jewel goes to follow him because Jewel's like, if he's dealing with the jackals, the jackals can't be trusted. So I need to follow him and make sure that everything's all right. But he is not prepared in the slightest for what he actually finds. Which is Kilo 5 giving weapons to Telcam and kind of giving him the his army the resources to start the civil war. And so Jewel's be trying to be super sneaky. And then <laughs> Naomi just comes out of nowhere and just clonks him. Oh, she kicks the shit out of him. I love it. And she captures him, and then she takes off her helmet, and he's just so ticked off that it's a woman. He's like, oh my god. He he can't get over the fact that not only... He, he kind of like, okay, I've been captured by a demon. I kind of like, this is a thing. It's kind of honorable. It's sort of okay. Oh my god, it's a female demon. Ugh, oh god, what have I done? Now I need to escape. It's like all of my yeah. honor's doomed because I got caught by this woman. And then they're like taken back to the ship and cattle prod them a lot. Those scenes are really funny because it's Jewel being just a huge dick and wanting to get out. And then Phillips being like, hey, little guy, are you hungry? Do you need a snack? And he's like, fuck, fuck off. In the, all of this, Jewel's also trying to get on with the idea of baby because he... He can't cope with the idea of like a smart mouth AI that is giving him shit. He's like, AI should run the ship, do the navigating and shut the fuck up. And BB's just like doing his head in the whole time. Well, the big kicker in this is Jewel ends up in Onyx or Trevelyan. They're just like, you know what, where should we take him? Uh, let's take him to the slip space place and just kind of dump him there. So. Let's keep our new pet elite somewhere where we can keep a wee eye on him. And it's filled with scientists who are fascinated by him, which he hates. It's yeah, hilarious. Yeah, and they go on to do a lot of things with him. Shit happens with Pearl Jewel. You can see why he would hate hum humanity. Yeah, like the hu only don't do anything to win Jewel over in all of this. No, they're just like, ah, fuck this guy. Also, shout out to the fact that we learned that elites can't pronounce their PHs or can't pronounce Phyllis. their Ipsis because they call him Phyllis. Now, here is an interesting piece of trivia. Oh. So, the Halo uh, Glasslands features Easter eggs that reference Red vs. Blue, as Karen Travis is a huge fan of the, of the series. This includes Black Box saying Yoink as one of the audiences commenting on... Uh, and one of the audience he's commenting on thinking as St. Healy said Blarg. Um, the St. Healy <laughs> mispronouncing the name Phillips as Phyllis, which is a phonetic pronunciation of the AI Phyllis from Red vs. Blue. That's amazing. But I never knew that. I need to get caught up with Red vs. Blue. <laughs> yes, we have book clubs to do on that too, that we've been talking about for years. Uh, one last big plot point that I don't, don't think we've uh, gone through yet is the plot point of Oni has... Every record of where the original Spartan 2s originated, where they were, who their family was, everything. Osman has access to hers. Naomi has access to hers. Neither of them have read them. Yeah, it's such a great moment of Naomi's character is by far my favorite, I think, in this in this book. And I love her character development over the series. But like that moment of like giving her her file and telling her she can read it if she wants. She gets Mal to read it. She gets Vaz to read it. And then like he ends up extra furious because he, he's like going through. This is it, where he like, goes to kill. Yeah, he's like, I can't read the shit about what they did to her. And then he goes on to what happened after Naomi was kidnapped. And that's the f like, OK, it gets worse when we get into Mortal Dictata. But there's a real kick in the teeth in this bit where... He goes through this file and he finds out that Naomi's mum, uh, basically, she decided she couldn't, because the clone died of a genetic disorder, Naomi's mum decided she couldn't have any more children. So her, the, the marriage basically breaks down between uh, Naomi's mum and herself? dad. Doesn't she kill She then commits suicide a few months yeah. later. So Vaz is like, fuck, 
And then he goes on to find out that uh, Stefan Sinski, who is Naomi's dad, went on to basically figure it out. He doesn't have all the clues, but he, he, like, he's left a bit of a trail behind him where he, like, made complaints that this child wasn't his daughter, that he knew something was up, and then Vaz is reading this going, like, fuck, you were really close to, like, getting all the answers here. And the big, big kicker is at the end of this book... Uh, they're in Venezia, and their spy in Venezia is named Spencer, and he's going through the biggest targets of Venezia. And guess who shows up? But Mr. S- what, Stefanson? Stefan Stefansinski. That's his name. Stefansinski. It's a big thing of, like, your dad is a crazy insurrectionist. Yeah, I love that scene when it happens. I, is it... Uh... Yeah, Vaz is looking through the files and Vaz sees this picture and he just locks on it and Mal's talking to him and is like, oh, we know this guy or we know his daughter and Mal still hasn't figured it out yet. And he's talking to him and he's like, do we know his daughter? Have I slept with his daughter? And he's like, hmm, <laughs> Spartan Naomi Sinski. And he's like, oh, shit. It's a great place to leave up on this book because... It's that bomb drops, and then the literal bomb drops in Sanghelios, and then everyone gets on onto uh, the ship and is like, we gotta go save Phyllis. Yeah, and they will go on to do fantastic things with this whole Naomi Honestly, family Honestly, after stuff. reading the other two books and reading the whole trilogy, this book is almost 100% set up for the other two books. Oh, totally. Like, this book... I don't think, is it spoilers to say that this book like wraps up Ghosts of Onyx and the next book will like focus more on Jewel and then the last book leans into the like the Naomi stuff? And the Spartan 2 stuff. Yeah, no, that's that's fair to say. That's kind of what's coming in these next books. Does anyone have anything else to really add in here? Any loves, hates, ratings? No, I've kind of said all my bits. Um, another bit of trivia, I guess, is to say the novel. This novel introduces the word "glasslands" as an in-universe term for Hugh Connolly worlds that mean glass during the war. Um, the cover was illustrated by a former Bungie concept artist named Eddie Smith, and there's an excerpt from the first novel was released on September 2001 issue of the official Xbox magazine, which I thought that was interesting. Really? Oh, something. It's going back a little bit, but we never really talked about is. One thing on Onyx that I really enjoy the whole time is the Lucy storyline. Oh, so if you don't remember Lucy, she was in Ghosts of Onyx. She's one of the Spartan Threes. She's a beta? She is. Lucy and Tom are the two from the start of the book. They watch their whole company get killed. There's a lot of stuff in this book that happens and we totally forget to mention that like Blue Team are in this book as well. We just haven't talked about them at all. They don't do much though. Like... Lucy's the only one of the Spartans trapped in Onyx that does much, because all of the other Spartans are like, we can't fight anything, let's just patrol. And they just patrol around the entire uh, the entire length of the book. Yeah, Lucy has this, uh, she has this PTSD where she stopped speaking. This has gone on, I think it finishes all in Ghost of Onyx where she tries to say bye to Kurt before he sacrifices himself. And then in this book, it's her slowly like rediscovering her voice and who she is. With the help of engineers, no less. Yes. Um, Adj, uh, I forget his full name, needs adjustment. Yeah, quick to adjust. Quick to adjust. And he tries to fix her. And a couple of times he's like, reclaim her, Lucy. You aren't broken. I can't fix you. What's wrong? And he eventually like he brings her back to Blue Team and everyone else. And Lucy discovers her voice properly when she punches Halsey because Halsey's bullying the engineers. Yeah, it's it's really great. Yeah, she sees the engineers as floaty computers and she wants answers from them and she's clearly upsetting Adge and the others and Lucy decks her. It, it, it's, it's a pretty amazing scene. It's just Lucy yelling no at the top of her lungs, but she goes through a lot of character development in this. We don't really see her until like the last light books right no legacy of onyx is when tom and lucy come back into it because they're they go to be they go to train the spartan fours and then they get sent to onyx with mendez 
and then it's the ferrets, the gammas, they go It's the gammas, yeah, Mark, Olivia, light. and Ash that end up in that. So yeah, we don't see Tom and Lucy for quite a long time after this. No, I think there's that. Is it a short story in Fractures, is it? Yeah, there is, yeah. Yeah, we don't it's see It's the one where they're the training the Spartan Force? Yeah, and I think Lucy is like the tiniest Spartan. Oh. Yeah, she's very small. I think Halsey comments on it that like she's she's not a... She's not an impressive Spartan by any means, but she's like, she's hard as fuck. Yeah. Great book. Loads of crazy storylines. It goes everywhere. There's so many things that it touches on and kicks off. Does a lot of stuff well. Obviously has some negatives. All the Halsey hate kind of turned it off for me a little bit, but uh, I did. It. I do enjoy the book and the series is great. I look forward to reading them all again. Aaron? Overall, I enjoy it. I like the Halsey stuff in so much as it makes me stop to think about the dark side of the Spartan 2 program in a way that I like yeah, just willfully true. ignored up until now. So I like I like that. I've liked Karen Travis for a while because I read her Gears of War books before this and anyone that can make Gears of War a compelling universe is a pretty good author in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. There's not a huge amount to Gears other than steroid soldiers with chainsaw guns, but she like does an awful lot with it. And then she does likewise with this. She's very good, I think, at building characters and personalities. And I think that's what really, like, it's the characters in this more so than the events that I think I enjoy the most. B.B. Phillips, uh, when you go on to Mortal Dictata, you get uh, Naomi's dad. Yeah, that relationship, the relationships in this and the story arcs the characters go on are pretty great in the series. Yeah, I think that's where... Travis really like excels for me in what she does with Halo. She deals with some of the heaviest stuff in the Halo universe. True, because the o- the other story she did is in Evolutions. It's the Cortana story. Yeah, yeah. She's dealing with the hard emotional stuff. Oh, I forgot about that. Uh, what do we call that Cortana story? Human weakness. Human weakness. That that was her first like dabble into this. It's it's cool. I, I enjoy these books. These and the Forerunner trilogy are my favorites, but I couldn't pick between them. It's okay, you don't have to. I think these books are really good. I think they establish a lot of different stuff in the universe. And I think some of the more some of the things that people hate and but also love about these books are of course the change in perception. Just looking at the Spartan program from a different angle and looking at it from a different eye. And I think that's what makes these like it makes them kind of off-putting to us because the perspective is so different than what the Halo use, Halo universe has been feeding us previously. But I think that's also what makes these books really interesting is just looking at what happens when those kids were taken away. You know, what are the ramifications? Um, you know, what do we do with the person who did this, even though her spart- her research actually saved humanity? I mean... It's dealing with all of these crazy ethical questions and how how do we make it right or is it even right to do anything at this point? I think these books deal with so much more than just fighting aliens and discovering ancient artifacts, and that's what I really like about them. Well said, Krista Brown. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to try to be on time for this next book club because this was supposed to be at the end of April and now it's mid May. So we're gonna try Sorry, to get guys. to we're gonna try to get to Thursday War, hopefully end of May, beginning of June. And of course we're probably going to get to Mortal Dictata after that. So stay tuned for more of the Kilo 5 trilogy and Karen Travis and all of her amazing writing. Thank you for watching or listening or however you consume our media. Join us on Discord if you want to talk more with us about the novel or more with other Halo fans about the novel. We also have a Facebook group, a website, halopodcastevolve.com. Oh, halopodcast.com. Yes, shout out to Ian who got us a second domain. Thank you, Ian. (laughs) Halopodcast.com. Can't believe that was in the open. Yeah, this is kind of strange. But Podcast Evolve wasn't. It's, It's weird. Yeah. Thank you for listening, and we will see you in the next book club. Evolve! Evolve! Evolve.